So I'll go through and kind of give you a introduction to Unreal. Um, as it were, the, the map that you downloaded from the assignment, uh, from the content, is, uh, is going to be a zip file. Uh, that once you open it up, it's a seven zip file. Once you open that up, you're gonna end up with a folder called engine lighting. And inside here, you're gonna have all the content that you need to launch the engine. Now, if you've already installed the engine, um, that's good. We can actually launch it another way. But if you just open up this folder and double click on the engine lighting U project, that will launch the engine for the first time. I'm gonna show you the other means that we have for launching the engine, which is by opening up the launcher. And the Epic Games launcher is kind of your home base for everything Unreal. It contains um, links to games. It's not just the development side of things. Uh, we're in the Unreal Engine category here on the left. And, uh, and there's some tabs over the top. And if we go into some of the other tabs here, uh, we can go to the store. And then that's where all the game stuff is going to be. So they... Hey, they have free games that they give away every now and then. You can see there's a Black Friday sale on, and you got all the games here that you can pick up and play um, through the Unreal Engine. And so uh, this is kind of everybody getting in on the uh, on the Steam uh, kind of thing. And so they're all all starting to have these launchers now where you can get these games. And so uh, this is one of those things. We've now got a, uh, a means of getting some games here, and they do give away stuff for free on on occasion. Uh, I'm going to go back down to the engine portions where the development side of things is kept. Right now, I'm in the Unreal Engine tab, which contains um, a few things. It's got some links up here at the top to the YouTube channel and some places where you can find information about the engine. There's some, uh, some featured content and some projects that people are working on that they're going to kind of show off. Um, industry news and things coming up with the engine and that kind of stuff. The next tab over is called Learn. And to Learn, you're going to see some kind of shortcuts to getting started in the engine. So if you're brand new to the engine, they have a Getting Started with Unreal 4 that'll kind of introduce you to the engine. They have a Quick Start Guide if you're an artist, and a Quick Start Guide if you're a level designer, and a Quick Start Guide if you're a programmer, as well as um, some kind of uh, recent things that have been going on in the in the software, you know, new things that they've played with, new features that they've added, and things like that. And then they've got some uh, engine samples, and these are these are versions of the engine that have uh, have stuff preset up in them for you. Uh, so they've got some. Here's a digital human uh, where they've got you know some uh, 3D character bust that is being rendered with a really high end skin shader and really high end hair shader and really high end eye shader um, with some really nice lighting and some camera setups to show you you know how how human they can make things in the engine. Um, there's some, you know, in-camera VFX and some uh, some physics here in the uh, chaos destruction system. And so a lot of things that you can go play with that they use as means of being able to teach you uh, how to use the engine and some of the things that the engine can do. If I scroll back up to the top here, I'm going to go to the next tab over, which is the marketplace. So the marketplace is where you can uh, you can pick up content created by other users uh, and in some cases, actually even created by uh, by people from Epic and, uh, and some professionals to get stuff out there. Uh, and these are, um, these are files that you can use in your projects. Um, they have everything here from, from code and VFX and levels and characters and animations and essentially all, all aspects of game design. Um, they're going to have some example files and some files that you can pick up in order to throw them into your game. And... They, they run the gamut of, you know, from free all the way up to several hundred dollars. You know, here is a, um, a modern loft uh, that somebody has made, which is $388 and a penny. Um, and so they've got kind of all these different level things here. There's always a section that is free for the month, which I try to pick up every month, even if it's something that I don't uh, currently have any use for. You never know when down the road, I'm like, oh, I'll go take a look at that and see see what they did inside there. Maybe even reverse engineer it and make my own version of this. Um, and then they have some kind of new releases and discounted things here that you can pick up. And so any really any kind of game that you want to make, you can find some systems that are pre-built and uh, whatnot to help you along with some of the weaker sides of your development abilities. As I mentioned, there's also content here released by um, by Epic themselves 
the um, the Paragon game, which is now defunct. Um, all of their content was released inside of that there for free, and so you've got a ton of stuff uh, that is available there. Um, the next tab over is the library, and this is where all of the projects that you've worked on and the engine builds that you have are going to be available to you. So here up at the top, you'll have a list of the engine versions that are currently installed on your machine. You can see I currently only have a single version, which isn't actually the case, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, I have 4.25.4, which is actually the build that the environment we're working in um, was built. And uh, well, it wasn't built, but I, I made some changes to it and saved it. And so it has been saved in 4.254. And so that's the version that you will need at least to uh, to get these things open. Um, you can hit the little plus up here and you can go get yourself new versions of the engine. You see if I hit that, it's going to ask me to install 4.243, which is actually an older version, not something I would want. But I could use the drop down and go pick up, uh, and pick any other version here, uh, including a preview uh, to 4.26, which is a uh, an upcoming version. Um, and so you can go check out some of the new features and things like that that are coming out. Below that category, we have a list of my projects. Now, these are the current versions of the engine, the current projects that you've opened up and have been playing with. So you can see I have the content examples here. I also have the digital humans, which is another content example. And then I have some other things that I've made. So I've got from my character classes that I teach, the three different character selection games that I've made. I've got the Turner Made project, which is where I do a lot of my uh, my tutorials and where I show st if students have questions, you know, hey, how would you do this? Um, I'll go and I'll just build it in here. It's kind of my test bed of uh, trying out new systems and trying out new things. Um, I've got Splat, which was uh, originally it was going to be a little first person shooter I was making, and uh, and in the end, I ended up uh, I ended up not wanting to do that any further. But I've I've still used this as a kind of test bed for other things. Could probably get rid of that entire thing, um, and then over the other one here, this is the one that kind of uh, is is worth mentioning. You'll notice in the bottom right hand corner of each of these little pop ups here, or each of these little icons, there is a build number. So four point two five, four point two four, four point two four, and then the rest are all four point two five, except for the first one, which says other. The reason it says other is this is a build of the engine that I've compiled myself. So I've made a branch of 4.25 um, that I, I've grabbed the source code and have started compiling it myself on my end. And so this is so that I can make my own changes to the engine and make my own uh, code systems that I can put into place um, without having to manipulate the, the actual engine that is from Unreal. So I've got my own branch that I'm currently working in for this whole, this little project here. The next section down is the vault, which is where all of the objects or systems or components that you've purchased from the micro, the uh, marketplace will show up. And what you can do is you can go and click on any one of these things here. Uh, so here is the character Terra from Paragon. And I could go click the add to project, choose one of the projects, and then hit the add. And it'll go put all that content files. Uh, it'll go and download those uh, content those packages and it'll go and put them into the um, into the folder where that character is. And so, um, like I said, a bunch of these things are things that I picked up that were that were free for the month or uh, or things that I was interested in trying or playing with. And some of them are things that I had no interest in. Um, and so they're kind of all over the place here. They're they're uh, really useful things and some things you know, less useful for me, but um, they're all things that I've, I've accumulated over the over time. And so when you double click that U project, it's gonna open the game here. I'm gonna I'm gonna close the launcher because I'm gonna launch this the way that you guys are gonna launch it. So I'm gonna double click the launcher or the uh, the U project, and I will let this open up. Now, when you guys open this for the first time, it is going to take more time on your end uh, to open than it does on my computer. You're gonna see that on my computer, it pops open pretty quickly. Um, and the reason for that is that I've already had this open on my computer, so it's already kind of sitting in memory. When you load the map for the first time, as Kyle has pointed out, it is going to compile shaders. And uh, this is this is not actually your computer. It is uh, it is it is unreal. It takes a while for it to compile its shaders. Uh, you will find yourself online plenty and plenty of uh, of UE4 memes. Um, for uh for shader compiling um this is this is one of the downsides of this engine 
um, where you, <laughs> the bigger the project, the more things that are in there. Uh, it is uh, it is one of those things. It's got to go through. Um, it's one of those things. Uh, this is welcome. Welcome to the world of Unreal. Uh, and I don't understand either how this works, but you'll get this you'll get this compiling shaders and you'll have the number of shaders that it's compiling. And on occasion it'll pop into negative numbers, which I don't I don't even understand how that can how that can happen. But anyway, um it opens really quick on my machine here because it's already loaded into memory. Uh, I've had it open. I had it open with the previous section. And, uh, and I've now got it open with you guys. And so uh, yeah, I have no need to compile the shaders here. They're already going um, on my machine. And so just give it time. It'll, it'll finish processing. Um, you may recognize the map here that we are going to be lighting. Um, at least some of you may. Uh, this is a, uh, the first floor of the home from Edith Finch. And so I've gone into the map and I've stripped out all of the lighting that is there. And so we're back down to kind of a bare uh, geometry kind of world here. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a tour here of Unreal as it's open um, so that we can kind of get to navigating. So over on the left, we have the Place Actors tab. And this is where we can grab things to drag them into the world in order to start constructing the world. Um, they are broken up into categories, recently placed, basic, light, cinematic, visual effects, geometry, volumes, and then everything all together in the all classes section. And the way that these work is you just grab something, drag it into the world, and it'll now live in the world. I'm going to delete that because I don't actually want it there. The next window over, the very large window here that we can see into the world, is the viewport. And you can manipulate the viewport. Um, if you hold the right click down, you can use WASD with right click um, in order to move around the environment. There's no collision on things, right? So you will be able to clip through walls and stuff like that. Um, and then if you're a little bit more old school, um, there is a simple mouse orientation or mouse fly through uh, that you can get used to. A lot of, uh, a lot of older folk use this because it's something that's been around Unreal for a long time. Um, this one is done by simply left-clicking and dragging. Um, and when you left-click drag, it'll move your camera through the world. And so I can drag and kind of move it as I go. And then if I add the right click, I can increase the height as I go. And so that's a little bit of a, uh, a little bit more of a screwball way of manipulating things. Uh, not a lot of people use that. And so right-click WASD will allow you to move around. Try and angle this here so I'm looking at something darker. There we go. So up in the top left-hand corner of the viewport are some settings that are going to allow you to change how things are being rendered in Unreal. Um, we have perspective here. This is the name of the camera that we are currently looking out of. And we can see that we can drop down into top, bottom, left, right, front, and back. And so each one of those is a separate camera that we can look out onto the world. We have our rendering mode. And so I'm currently set to lit. We can also go to unlit, which will remove all lighting from the uh, the environment. So we can actually just see base colors, which is a, a pretty good way of being able to uh, start setting things up if the world is too dark. Um, we can also switch this into wireframe in which we'll see all of the triangles from the geometry everywhere. Uh, and so on. There's a whole bunch of these things. There's lighting only. There's reflections, player collision and all that stuff. We're just going to stick into the uh, lit mode here because we are going to be doing lighting in the engine. And uh, and that's the best place to be able to see the lighting is if we are actually using the lit mode. Now, when I take a look around here, we can see that there is a fair amount of lighting that appears to already be in the engine. Um, and you're going to notice a weird artifact that happens. So I'm going to just move my camera slightly outside the building so I'm looking at the blackness of space. And if I bring the camera back into the building, you're going to notice that it's really hard to see anything. And eventually, the lighting is going to pitch back up until it's bright again. Now, this is a popular response that they're uh, imitating here or a, uh, a contracting of the iris to shrink down the pupil or open up the pupil. And so. Yeah, no, that is, that's what's going to happen, Lucas. You got to just wait for the shaders to compile. 
Everything will be checker boxed until the shaders are compiled. And so what you're seeing is a uh, a reproduction of what happens with the eyes getting used to the amount of lighting in a in an environment. Um, and this this does make it a really really I mean it is a neat feature to have that, but it really does make it hard to light an environment when the environment is constantly adjusting to the amount of light in the environment. So we're in a room right now without any lights in it. And what the engine is mimicking is because the environment is so dark, your eyes are adjusting to the darkness and it's brightening up the environment to make it look like we can actually see. This is going to be a little bit problematic. And so we're going to go, uh, we're going to need to go and do um, a few things here to kind of get this turned off. Uh, I don't, I don't typically do anything with this system turned on. And so we're going to do a, a little bit of adjustment here to get that back. Uh, but we'll come we'll come back to that. On the right, I have my world outliner. Now this indicates to me everything that is in the world currently. Um, there's going to be a huge list of static meshes, which is just about everything that is in this world. Um, I'm going to go and sort these by type here. And we're going to see there's a couple other ones here. So this is a player start. That means that when we play the game, this is where the character will begin. Now this is not the game uh, of what, what happened to Edith Finch or what, uh, what I don't remember the actual name of the game, um, but the Edith, Edith Finch game. This is, um, this is actually just the Unreal third person template and I've brought this content in. So this player start here, this is actually where the player normally starts and it's embedded in the, uh, the table. And I could, I could select that and move it around if I want to. Um, the engine won't allow me to spawn in the table. So if I hit play, It'll actually just bump me up to the top of the table. Um, and then it'll allow me to kind of run around the environment here. And so I can actually um, kind of move around uh, if I wanted to. I'll hit escape to pop back out of there. We don't actually need to do any kind of gameplay anything. But that's what that uh, that's what that player start is for. Um, you can actually even just delete it. Uh, it's not going to be needed for what we're going to do. The other thing that's here that is not a static mesh is called a sphere reflection capture. Now this is going to be located in the dining room near the really shiny um, uh, light fixture that's in here. And that's actually why this is here. This thing is a very chrome object with a lot of reflections in it. And, and this little reflection capture actor here, what this does is it kind of captures the environment and uses that bit of the environment in the reflection. So if you watch some of the um, some of the the extents of the the geometry here, as I move this, you can kind of see that reflection moving a little bit as this actor captures different parts of the world for its reflection. And so that's why they've got this there. It's a very shiny thing. You can keep that. You can leave that. It doesn't really matter. It will not affect our lighting. I'm going to do most of what I'm going to be doing here to begin with inside of the uh, the kitchen because that is going to be the easiest place to do the things here. Now you notice the panel down below our world outliner. Uh, I've got two panes here. I've got details and world settings. Now world settings are actually a list of all of the settings in the world. So these are kind of global settings for the environment in which we find ourselves. And then we also have the details pane and the details pane um gives us all of the current properties or the properties for whatever we currently have selected so for instance if i grab this little pot on the table here i will get properties for the static mesh which tells me what kind of static mesh it is what geometry is being used what material is being used and then some other settings like physics collision and lighting we have its location rotation and scale so all of these little things that we can play with here Every time we choose something else, if I grab the Reflection Capture Actor, we'll get settings for the Reflection Capture Actor. If I select the wall, I'll get settings for the wall. And so all of these are all properties for whatever you currently have selected. Um, and if you happen to select nothing at all, you'll get nothing in your properties. So the first thing I want to do in setting up my lighting here is A, remove that pupipular response or that that eye adaption that's going on in the engine to do that i'm going to grab we're going to go into the volumes category here and i'm going to grab what is called a post process volume now this is the kind of thing that alters the way the engine is rendering i'm just going to drag one of these into the world so click drag 
and I'll let it go in the world here. And it shows up as this little orange cube in the world. Now, this is a collision volume. It is something that it detects whether or not uh, any vertices have gone within its, its bounds. And uh, there are two ways that you can use post-processing. And what post-processing is, is going to do is that every frame that gets rendered in the game engine is going to get processed in some way, whether by playing with its uh, contrast or its lighting or its color value. Uh, you can play with uh, how much color is there and how little color is there. You can play around with the depth of field. There's a lot of things that you can play around with that all happen after each frame is rendered. And you got to be careful with post-processing because the more you do, the slower the game actually renders things because if you're rendering 60 frames a second, it is going to be applying these effects to frames 60 times every second. And so it can, it can actually slow down what you're doing. So you got to be careful with what you do inside of these things. But uh, that is one of the things. Um, uh, that is one of the things that you can do. That's really, really cool. Um, you can use these as a volume. So right now it's a cube. And, uh, and it'll only work if I'm actually inside of it. So if I bring the camera inside, I would now be uh, getting the effect of what's in the cube. So... For instance, if I go to the properties here and I do a search for saturation and I turn on the global saturation and I bring its, um, its value down to zero, I've completely desaturated the world. But because I'm not inside the cube, we don't see it. When the camera moves inside the cube, you see that now the world's desaturated. And as I move out, it goes back to the way it was. Now, you also notice it's not a pop. It is a blend, a fade that happens. And again, we have control over that. This type of setup is really good if you were going to be doing something like a character that dives underwater. Being able to set a post-process volume where your body of water is and changing the way the game is rendering when the character is in the water will kind of allow the player to get immersed in that volume, uh, in, in the fact that they are underwater. You know, gives them a little bit more of that um, that immersion. Um, you can also do things that happen like when your character dies, right? The screen turns black and white. You can do that kind of thing as well. <clears throat> because we don't want this thing to affect just this area. I mean, we could make the cube huge and, you know, make it over the entire environment. Uh, but another thing we could do here, I'm going to keep the desaturation all the way down uh, to, to be able to show you how this works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to type in the word bound here and I'm going to turn on the infinite extent. And this makes sure that the volume here is infinite. So it's not just checking for whether or not the player is inside of this volume, but it just checks to see if the player is anywhere in the world. And since we are, the whole world will now be black and white. So for instance, if I wanted to do something kind of film noir, you know, let's, we're doing a, a murder mystery here, and we want to do it in a kind of 50s era. You know, I could go and uh, let's keep that turned on. Let's kill our search. Um, I now have the ability of making everything black and white. That doesn't really feel, um, it doesn't really feel um, uh, film noir yet. Um, but I can go into the color grading, and I can turn the shadows on. Um, and I can really darken the shadows, right? Give them way more blacks. Um, I can go into the midtones and I can give the midtones even more black. And then I can go into the highlights and we can turn on the highlights so I can play with how bright or dark the highlights are. So I'll pitch those down and then I can go into the contrast and we can amp up the contrast. And now we start getting something that feels a little bit more film noir. And so by just playing with some of these values here, you can see that you can really change the tone and look of a game. I haven't actually manipulated any textures or anything like that. I'm just playing around with what's there. And when you make changes to any of these things, it can be, uh, again, really hard to remember what type of settings uh, were there originally, right? What, what these values were before we changed them. And you'll notice that anything that has changed has now got a little yellow arrow beside it. And what that does is it'll actually go and put that back to its original default state. So if I go click on all these little yellow arrows, everything gets reset back to where it was. And I'm now turning these things back off. 
And it's as though nothing would have ever been done. And so you can actually go through here, all the settings. There is a ton, a ton of things that are here that you can play with. It'll all change the way that this is being rendered from being able to turn up or down certain colors. If you remember when we looked at the uh, Transformers screenshot last week, there was a lot of blues and oranges that were turned up and everything else was really pushed back and desaturated. So you could do that with color correction inside of here. Now, if I head over to the living room and we go and look at the windows, uh, you'll see that there's a, a body of water outside. And if I actually move the camera outside to look, uh, it's really black out here. We're not actually seeing anything. And that's because some of the information that was used to create the sky is gone. It's not actually in the world anymore. And we're gonna wanna create that stuff. So I'm gonna go and create a exponential fight, uh, an exponential height fog. So I'm gonna go into the place actors. I'm gonna do a search for EXP for exponential. And it's the only thing that comes up. And watch how magic this is to the environment. I'm going to click and drag this into the world. And the second it's in the world, we can actually see a sky. Now, there's all kinds of settings on this thing as well for how dense the fog is and what color the fog is and uh, at which distance the fog starts removing. But just dragging this in, we can see that there actually is a lot more of a world out here. And if I go back into the home, you can actually see a lot more of what's going on out there. Now I'm actually still getting the eye adaption. I can still see it turning on and off here as I go up and down. So I'm gonna go back into the kitchen where I left my volume here and I'm gonna do a search for brightness and I found the exposure settings. And what I wanna do is I wanna turn both the minimum brightness and the maximum brightness on. And I wanna make sure that the minimum brightness is set to one so that it doesn't actually brighten anything on its own. You can see that the world just got a whole lot darker. And I'm also gonna take the maximum brightness and bring it down to one. And putting one in both of these values will, for the most part, remove that eye adaption. So now this is not going to change if it gets brighter or darker. This is a little bit more indicative of what we would see, right? If we had a, we were inside of a home that during the day, we can see that it's it's bright enough outside that it's daytime, that you don't actually see any light in the house. It feels like you're in a dark home. Again, a great deal of this is coming from the exponential height fog. But if we turn that off, we can see it actually is darkening the home. Now, when I made my basement that I did, I, did, I added exponential height fog, but I didn't want it to be this blue. If you see, far away from the camera here, everything kind of tints towards blue. That's the fog in scattering color. If you take this and you move this more into the orange range, you can actually make it start to look like it's a little bit dusty in the environment. This is because the fog is actually orange and not blue. If you take a look at what that does outside, we start getting something that looks a little bit more like a sunset. I make it blue again, we get blue sky again. So let's look at the different types of lights now that we can use to light the environment. So we have the ability to play with colors and things like that. I'm gonna take the exponential height fog here and I'm just gonna leave it out on the deck. Um, these, some of these assets here, it doesn't matter where you place them. They're, they're omnidirectional, it doesn't matter where they go. Um, but in order to keep finding them, in order to know where they are, I will, uh, I will typically kind of keep these things in, uh, in a place where I can find them. And so I'm gonna leave the exponential height fog here outside on the deck. I'm gonna head over to the Place Actors tab and I will go to the Light section and I'm gonna go and take a look at the lights that are here. We have six different options, directional light, point light, spotlight, sorry, five options, a rectangular light and a skylight. So let's take a look at what each of these things do. I'm just gonna move outside here again. We're gonna start with the directional light. I'm gonna place the directional light on the deck and we're going to get what appears to be a sunlight. So if we go take a look at this here now, we can actually see a icon that looks like a sun and a vector coming from it in white here. This indicates the directionality of the sun. So if I wanted to, I can go into rotate. You can hit W, E, and R to go move, rotate, scale. Those icons are also situated in the top right-hand corner of your viewport. 
So I'm going to go to rotate, and you can see that if I rotate this, I can change where the sun is. I can also change its azimuth by rotating it along X, meaning I can make it set to the point that it's now under the horizon. I can bring it back up and make it noon and have it shine straight down. And so this is going to allow me to have this kind of uh, time of day. Yep, that's fine. If you look at uh, if you look at my screen here too, Kyle, you're going to see the exact same thing. So I have two things that are being displayed, right? Reflection capture needs to be rebuilt, and I have lighting needs to be rebuilt. It tells me there's 1,078 objects here that are not built. Now, the reason that it wants us to build the lighting is that we have three different modes of lighting inside of Unreal. They are found in the properties when you have a light selected. I currently have the directional light selected. And under the transform and mobility, we have static, stationary, and movable. A static light is just that. It's a light that doesn't change. This means that during gameplay, we wouldn't be able to move this light or rotate it in any way. Doing so will break all of the lighting. When you set your lighting to static, it is the most uh, performance light, meaning it, it has the, the smallest cost to, um, to, being, uh, to being used, but it's going to require you to create a light map for every asset that you create. Now, light maps are important because they are where the shadow lives, so it's going to bake these shadows into each of your meshes. Now, if you notice here, written on the floor, in my shadow, it says preview. This is an indication that we are just looking at a temporary version of that lighting. We would need to bake the lighting out in order to get something a little bit more uh, realistic and final. And until we do that, we are going to get this air here that it needs to be rebuilt. To get rid of that reflection capture, uh, we can go to the build option and we can go build reflection captures. And it'll just take a part of a second here. Uh, Kyle says, I once baked static lighting in Unity that took about 30 hours to bake. Yeah, uh, I don't doubt it. Um, this environment here takes my machine, uh, I don't know, a minute to bake. Uh, it's not too bad here. Um, I have environments like my, my washroom diorama that I did. Um, that took me about 17 hours to bake. I've got really high-end lighting in there, and I've got a lot of light bounces and things like that, and so it's giving me a far more complex lighting than just a sunlight in here. I didn't actually bake the lighting. Uh, if you notice, it still says preview in here. I'm still in preview mode. All I did was just bake the reflection capture actor, and that was actually just because I moved it. When I move it around, it actually breaks the capture, and i got to recapture it again. But since you asked, let's go take a look at baking the lighting. If you go to the build drop down at the top, I can go say build lighting only. Now, granted, I'm in I'm in the uh, pre preview mode. It's not going to be very um, a very high end render of the lighting, um, but it will it will start up. It's going to start something called Swarm, which is a network um, a network communication tool that will allow you to bake the lighting on multiple computers at once. Um, this is really handy if you're in an environment uh, like a game studio where you can use everybody's machines to bake the lighting. Uh, and there, it's actually, it has finished baking the lighting. And uh, what you're going to see, uh, I got an error here that some there's some uh, issues with some of the meshes, but that's okay, we're not dealing with the meshes. Um, but here's now what the lighting looks like. So we're getting a, a little bit more of a completed version of the lighting. And so that wasn't too bad at all. Again, I'm, I'm only in preview mode here, so it's not giving me a fantastic bake. Just wait, Lev. Checkerboard means it hasn't finished compiling the materials yet. Just be patient. The other thing that I can do is switch this light to a stationary light. Now, stationary light means that it is going to, again, bake static light maps onto static meshes, but will then interact with dynamic actors. The other option we have is to make it movable. Now, if you look at the difference between static and movable, we're actually going to see that the movable gets a little bit more resolution or a little bit more 
uh, clear in what it's doing. And that's because this is a, a dynamic light. Now, this means that uh, it can move at runtime, and it means that all the shadows are going to be updated on the fly. They're not baked at all. So we won't see the word preview here anywhere. And I can rotate the light even just a little bit. And again, it updates all real time. This is a more expensive version of lighting, but it's something that we are totally capable of doing uh, with today's computers and game consoles. And so this is actually the form of lighting I'm going to be using. So the directional light here um, has a directionality, but not a source. So all of the light vectors or all the light rays are all coming along this vector. And they don't come from anywhere in particular. They come from everywhere in the map and they all shine parallel. This is meant to reproduce what the sun does. While the sun's rays aren't parallel, it is far enough away that by the time they reach Earth, they're pretty close to parallel. And that means that this is going to reproduce what a light source very far away would look like. And so instead of actually making something the size of the sun and as far away as the sun is from us, doing this will kind of reproduce the effect close enough. The other type of lights we have here, I'm going to go back into the home and go find myself a nice little quiet corner here to illustrate the next light. I'm going to grab a point light. Again, I'm going to drag that into my world, and you should see right away what a point light does. A point light emanates light from a specific X, Y, and Z position in the map. So here, I have a point light. I'm going to make it movable as well, because I want all my lights to be dynamic. And you can see I can move this around and we get some pretty neat shadows here moving around the world. I can go and put it under the table, move it back around. And this is going to give us the ability to kind of manipulate how lights work. Now, one of the things that you can do with these lights, I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna go and take a walk around. You'll notice that there's a little blue cross here towards the edge of the map. Now what this is, is it's the outer boundary. It's a giant sphere, and it's the outer boundary of where that light is emanating from. So if I were to, to take a look at this here, all of the light vectors are coming from this XYZ point, and the distance that they're traveling is this 10,000 units. When they hit 10,000 units, they are now worth zero in terms of how bright they are. So this is 0% brightness. And as we move closer to it, we get more and more of that brightness. I can go and change the scale of this. So if you watch down the hallway and I bring the attenuation radius down, you'll see that that blue sphere gets closer to us. And as it does, it starts shrinking in how far that light is traveling. And I can make it further so that the light travels more and more and more. This gives us a lot of control over how this light works. Again, I'm going to reset that value. I can also go in and we have intensity. And I can go and play with how bright the light is or how dim the light is. So we can make it just really, really, really dim. And again, we're going to get just a small amount of lighting here. So if I was doing something like a candle, you know, this is a much better way of doing that. I've got the intensity turned way down and I've got the light traveling very, very far or not very far at all. It's only a couple of meters here. I can also go in and play with the light's color. I can make the light red, or blue, or green, or yellow. And I can even just tint it a little bit, bringing it into a warm range. I'm going to go reset these values. And uh, here's something really cool we can do with these lights as well. I'm going to move this light over to the, uh, to the shelf here. So there's this... Uh, hutch over in the corner that has all of the dishes in it. I'm going to put the light inside the hutch and I'm going to create uh, some LED strip lighting here that is uh, going to show off all the really lovely furniture they've got. So I've got the light inside the hutch here and I'm going to go down to some more of the settings here. This one is called source radius. Now if I bring that radius up, we're going to develop a yellow circle. There it is there yellow sphere surrounding the light. And this is where the light is emanating from. So instead of just a single X, Y, Z point, the light is now emanating from everywhere within this sphere. 
So if you actually made a hanging light bulb, an actual light bulb like the icon that we see here, we can actually make the sphere the size of that light bulb and it would emanate the right way. I can also, let me bring this out here to show this a little bit better. I'm going to bring that that source down a little bit. Two levels down from that, we have the source length. And I can bring this up, and you can see that we can actually make the light bulb a giant tube. This is really helpful if you wanted to do neon lighting or um, the type of lights that you would see in a school, right? The, the big... Uh, uh, phosphorescent tubes that, that are in the ceiling here. And so by trying to re replicate what LEDs would look like, if I go and make this big tube here, and I'll shrink it down, I'm going to put it inside the hutch again. So I'm going to bring the length down, and I'm going to bring the radius down, and I'll go and put it inside the hutch. You can see that we can kind of get shelf lighting. I can go put this up here even up there. And so now you get these kind of like little LEDs in here that will light up that shelf so we can show off our our china really, really well. The example I gave the uh, the other class as well was to use it to light up the painting over here. So if I go and put this up where the painting is, I can use it as, again, I don't have geometry here to represent this, but you know, maybe there's one of these kind of hanging lights or coming from behind the painting uh, lamps that shows off what that painting looks like. And again, I can take that attenuation radius and bring it way down. But we actually have a light that's just illuminating that area. So a lot of really neat things that you can do here with just a point light and being able to control uh, all kinds of, uh, of things. You know, there's some lamps in this map. Um, and so we could we could always take our point lights and put them where the lamps are. Now it's important to note that the lamp is actually going to cast shadows. And so if I put the lamp or the light bulb in where the light bulb actually is in the lamp, which is up in here somewhere, we are uh, going to actually have it. You can see there's two light bulbs here, one on the left, one on the right. So probably the best way to reproduce this would be with this one. And again, give it a little bit of thickness and give it a bit of length and rotate it sideways 90 degrees so that the light is kind of emanating from the right area. I could put two lights in there as well, but uh, it may not do what I wanted to do in that regard. And so I can go do that kind of thing. I may want to take off the uh, the shadowing on the uh, on the light here. So there is a cast shadow section that I can turn off. And you can see that it's going to allow that light to kind of emanate everywhere. So the shade is not actually throwing shadow. Yeah, Taylor. So, well, this lampshade here doesn't actually have a hole in the top, which is kind of a problem. Uh, and the lampshade is not actually set up in a way to make it glow. And so you have a couple of options uh, when you do this. You can do like I did here and have the light uh, down and inside the lampshade like this, where it's doing its thing. The other thing you could do would actually be to bring it up and kind of above the light a little bit to kind of fake the fact that the light is emanating everywhere from that lamp. Again, it's not a really good design for a lamp to have a completely opaque um, material on it here like this. You know, that's not going not gonna to do at all what we want it to do. Um, and so you can kind of fake it. And you can see all of these lamps are going to be like that. There's lamps all over the place here. It is important to note that you guys don't have to adhere to the geometry. You don't have to put your lights where the lamps are. Um, you can, by all means, but remember that you're each going to be given a random theme. And you may not want to actually have all the lights turned on to do your theme. And so you may want to do some other things when it comes to uh, to doing the lamps here to make uh, make them do something a little bit different, depending on what, what kind of look you're trying to achieve. And so there, you can see I can put on this really kind of warm glow here. If you hit the, the G key on your keyboard, it'll enter what's called game mode. And that means it's going to hide all of your icons and show you a little bit of a better rendering here of what your world looks like. And so with that warm light in here, you can see that does a lot for the room in terms of making it feel a little bit more lived in. I like warm lights myself. Anyway, 
After the point light, we have a spotlight. I'm going to get out of game mode here so we can see the spotlight. I'm going to go bring it in here. And here is a spotlight. So spotlighting is like a point light, but instead of being omnidirectional, meaning the light travels all the way around, the spotlight only has a restricted angle to it. And again, we have the ability to play with that. We have the cone angle that we can play with so we can make it appear like this. Really good if you were doing a flashlight or something of that nature. Pot lights in the ceiling, you know, would also work in this way. If we bring this all the way up to the ceiling here, that's how a pot light would work. It would shine this light down like that. And so we have our attenuation radius. We're also going to have inner cone and outer cone. And so we can play around with those. And the inner cone is going to be where the light is 100%. And outside the outer cone is where it hits zero. So that's kind of our fall off that we get there. So this is going to, all the settings here are identical to the point light. It's just in the shape of a cone instead of omnidirectional like the point light. The next one we have, I'm going to bring this outside to do this. This is a rectangular light. And so I'm going to go up here to the, um, to the building here. And uh, where this window is, is where I'm going to put a rectangular. Light. So I'm going to go drag this out. And uh, if you can see this, it actually makes this rectangle. And I'm just going to rotate it 90 degrees to point it in the window. And I'll try and center it to the window here so that it's in about the right place. I'll move it forward. And these lights are really good for kind of faking the, the, the natural light that comes into windows. Um, and so I can go play with the width here and make this about the right width so that it does cover the window. And what's going to happen is inside the house you're going to see that we have light emanating from that window. So as I move this closer or further here, we can see that that kind of thing is going on. And if I were to go tint this, you know, a little bit in the blue range here, um, we would start getting what feels like, you know, light bouncing off the water coming into the house. And so, you know, you're starting to get kind of bounced light off the water up here. And I would probably bring that uh, attenuation radius down and also the brightness down. Again, it's it's kind of giving you that that effect of you know more light coming in the window from outside. And so yeah, there's a few settings on this which includes the barn door. Um, barn door is the uh, the angle at which you find the the window point. So it's almost like turning the rectangle into a spotlight. So as that barn door moves, it kind of opens or shuts the barn doors uh, to give you a little bit more or less angle coming out from the light and again a lot of the same kind of values that you have here you can even turn off shadowing if you want um, and again you can make these dynamic or static if you like lastly is the skylight now i'm going to delete the barn door here whoops that was the window i'm going to delete the barn door light here because i don't currently want it and i'm going to go into one of the darker places of the home here very uh briefly and what I'm going to add is a skylight. Now, when I do this, it's going to drastically change everything. If I bring this in, you'll notice now that we can actually see everywhere in the home. So what a skylight is, is indirect lighting. This is light that comes from everywhere and is meant to reproduce the bounced light that we get in the world. And so by having that light here, you can see that there is no real dark areas anymore. I've kind of lost all of the hard black shadows. If I turn that skylight off, you can see that I am indeed, uh, let's go find it, F and G, there it is there. So if we take this, uh, this skylight here and we go and bring down its brightness, uh, intensity, oh, that's the intensity scale. If I bring this to point 0.1, we're going to get very little bounced light. If I take it to 1, we're going to get the regular amount of bounced light. And 2 will double the amount of bounced light. Um, and so you can kind of go play around with this to get it to kind of hit that middle tone that you're looking for. Uh, and then there's also, you know, playing around with how close the sky is. It's going to capture the world and uh, light the, the world the right way. So if you've got a really bright area, it's going to use that bright area to relight the world. So uh, let's say you had a big red neon sign on one side of your map. Well, it's going to use red as a coloring from the area where the big red neon sign is. And so you can see if I go back up to the window here, we're actually really getting a, a nice amount of light coming in here from outside and from our lamp that's on. And there's little lamps and things hidden all over the house here. So you can kind of go play around with those. And 
uh, hit the kind of lighting that you're after. And again, you don't have to use all of these light modes. You can pick and choose the ones that you want to use. Um, and then it's just a matter of kind of lighting this map here uh, in a way that is best going to suit the theme that you're trying to achieve. I'm going to bring the sky distance down uh, on this guy a little bit more and bring that back. I really like having, you know, some, some areas here that do feel like they are dark. Um, and again, you know, I can bring another point light into the kitchen. Bring it up here to the, maybe up here somewhere. I think there actually is a light in the kitchen here. Why don't we put this in the stove? Ooh, that went the wrong way. That way. So if I go put this kind of under the hood for the stove here, we can make this appear as though it is the right thing. Again, I'll give this a little bit of thickness and a little bit of length. And I will rotate it again, 90 degrees. Make sure that it's movable so that I don't have to bake it. And I'll go and tuck it up here. And again, you kind of get the sensation that the overhead light on the stove is turned on. And so, yeah, it's a really neat way of being able to uh, to light the environment here. You can do all sorts of really, really neat things with this. And so those are pretty much all the tools that you're going to need uh, to light this. Um, and then it's just a matter of, of lighting it in, in regards to the theme that you're going to be given. So I'm going to do that now. We're going to go and give you guys your random themes. Um, and then you can go and light the world um, using these tools.